it's always fun to get a chance to talk about one of my favorite people, Weldon Keyes. And I think most of the people in the audience today know who Weldon Keyes is, but there are a lot of people out there who don't. And he's someone who more people should know about. And I hope that this program accomplishes that. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about him as a person, as a man, and also share some of his literature with you this afternoon. With Weldon Keyes, it's always fun to design a program because I have a choice of talking about either biography, because his life was fascinating and full of the twists and turns and interesting uh, facts that, that, that fill a life. And uh, it's always fun just to talk about his life and people find it fascinating. It's also fun to share his literature because it truly is uh, fine literature and uh, his poetry, his short stories, his essays are, are excellent and need a wider audience. And those of us in Nebraska need to claim this native son a little bit more. Weldon Keyes is best known as a poet, but he had a, a much richer life than uh, that compartment would allow him to fill. He was also a short story writer, a novelist, a painter in the abstract expressionist tradition. He was a musician, both a performer and a composer. He was involved in filmmaking. He wrote essays. He produced variety shows. He was a man who was involved in everything. And he was where it was happening in the world also. Uh, in New York, in San Francisco, in those places uh, beyond Nebraska where we, we, we often find that the, the art community uh, hides itself and then uh, sends out its treasures for the rest of us. And uh, Weldon Keyes was no different than, than most people and followed that, that pattern. I want to read just briefly an introduction on Weldon Keyes from Robert Knoll's collection. Uh, it's called Weldon Keyes in the Mid-Century Generation and it's a collection of the published letters of Weldon Keyes. His letters are marvelous and, and Robert Knoll, uh, Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Nebraska, provided some commentary along the way, and this is what he says about Weldon Keyes that serves as a good introduction. For 20 years, Weldon Keyes was at the cutting edge of his time. Alert to shifts in sensibility, aware of changes, he moved with his generation. Indeed, he moved in advance of it. He stood a bit apart, and the parade came along later, often down his street. Keyes had more than one string in his fiddle, and this was both his strength and his limitation. He got to the new enthusiasms before others, and he understood more than the crowd. Weldon Keyes did not so much move with his time, rather he anticipated new times. And those times of Weldon Keyes are what I want to talk about today. For those who might not be at all familiar with him, there are a couple of pictures of Keyes, uh, a very distinguished looking man, sophisticated, intellectual looking, uh, striking uh, appearance to Weldon Keyes. I'm going to take basically a chronological approach in talking about him because that will allow me, I think, to work in uh, the literature that I think is, is uh, important for us to hear as well. So let's go back to the beginning and uh, find his Nebraska roots. Weldon was born in 1914 in Beatrice, Nebraska. His father was president, later became president, of the F.D. Keyes Manufacturing Company in Beatrice, which had been founded by Weldon's grandfather. It, the, the company still operates in Beatrice. It's no longer owned by the Keyes family. It's uh, billed as the longest continually operating manufacturing facility in the state of Nebraska. And it started, uh, Weldon's German immigrant grandfather started it from a hardware store, a blacksmith shop hardware store that he had, and then he began manufacturing items, and uh, uh, the company grew. At the time Weldon was growing up, they were most famous for being a manufacturer of roller skates for the Chicago Roller Skate Company. Uh, roller skates, ice skates, husking pegs, farming equipment, that sort of thing was what they did in those days. To today they make primarily lawn care equipment, lawn mowers, and that sort of thing. The family, while Weldon was growing up, was 
as some people have said, in touch with the wealth of the community, if not the actual wealth of the community. Uh, they were a substantial family. They lived in substantial homes. They were a, a, a well-recognized presence in the community. But they did not have the wealth that uh, some of the more established members of the community had, but they were in touch with that wealth. Weldon's mother, wh whose name was Sarah Keyes, his father was John Keyes, his mother Sarah Keyes was an Easterner. She was never quite accepted in Beatrice or by the Keyes family, and I'm not sure she ever quite accepted them either. And there was always a little bit of conflict there. Uh, Weldon used to complain to friends about his mother, and his comment was, she's so middle class. And uh, for Weldon, that was not a good thing to be. Weldon had what, what for all uh, appearances, was a fairly normal childhood. Uh, his needs certainly were more than met. He attended public school. He had friends. He didn't always do the same activities that other children would do. For instance, uh, friends say that he was not interested in sports, as most boys are. But he served as uh, editor of the school yearbook. He wrote for the school newspaper. He put on neighborhood carnivals and shows with his friends. He edited and, and put out a, a little neighborhood newspaper. newspaper. Uh, so he was not a loner or an unhappy child from, from all uh, uh, appearances. At the same time, people say that he was not as outgoing and friendly as, uh, as, as some people were. Uh, his mother apparently always saw to it that he dressed very well, and that tended to, that's what people remember that made him stand out as a young man. Even then, he was involved in music, in theater, and in journalism. So uh, an interest in the fine arts and an interest in writing started very young with, with him. After graduating from Beatrice High School in 1931, he came to the university, well, at first he attended Doan College. Uh, so he does have a lot of Nebraska connections. The Doan College, of course, in Crete, uh, about 25 miles from Beatrice. And the, the conflicts with his parents begin to be apparent there. His roommate, his college roommate, tells the story that he would look out the window and see his parents drive up for a Sunday afternoon visit, and he would go out the back door to avoid them. After finishing his study at Doan College, he ended up at the University of Nebraska, and this is where he graduated in 1935. And it was while he was at the University of Nebraska that he began his serious writing. He came into contact with L.C. Wimberly, Lowry Wimberly, who was editor, founding editor of the Prairie Schooner, and who had so much to do with the careers of people like Mari Sandoz and Lauren Isley, uh, Rudolf Umland, and any number of fine Nebraska writers from that uh, 1930s period. And it was in Prairie Schooner that Weldon's first writing was published. His earliest writings were short stories, and I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what those were like. His short stories are very Midwestern oriented. They are clearly regional pieces. They're about the Midwest, uh, the place, and the people of the Midwest. And Weldon's idea of the Midwest was that it was a little bit of a stifling place, that it did not offer the opportunities that he thought the rest of the world offered. And the people who stayed here often stayed for one of two reasons, either because they were trapped here and they didn't have any choice and couldn't get away, or because they were hypocrites, they were small-minded, and they were the kind of people he thought that uh, the Midwest appealed to. So for those of us who like living in the Midwest, they aren't uh, very attractive or appealing short stories. They are, though, very much in the literary tradition of that time. Uh, what Sherwood Anderson was writing, what Sinclair Lewis was writing, those kinds of pieces is very much in that mold. And, and even the pattern of the stories follows Sherwood Anderson, his famous collection, Winesburg, Ohio. Uh, Keyes apparently set out to imitate. He sets a number of stories in, in a somewhat imaginary or mythical town, which he calls Weston, Nebraska. And he has some dozen short stories about that community. It's very clearly Beatrice, Nebraska. Uh, there's no doubt about it. One of the founding fathers of Beatrice was a man by the name of Weston, and the Weston family is still really uh, a, a, a fixture in the community of Beatrice. Uh, across the street from Weldon's boyhood home was the Weston Block, which had three fine homes of the Weston family, and many other descriptions of people and places in his stories ring 
more than just a little bit true with Beatrice. They are strikingly uh, true to the people and the places of Beatrice. The first story I want to read briefly from, I won't read any complete stories, but I'll, I'll read briefly from them. And I might mention his stories have been collected in, in this volume called The Ceremony and Other Stories. It's edited by Dana Joya, and the Heritage Room here has a number of copies for sale, and it's, uh, it is available, it's in print, and it's not a complete collection of his short stories, but some of his best stories are reprinted here. The one I want to read from is a story called Gents 50 Cents, Ladies 25 Cents, and the title refers to a dance hall one of those dance halls that most Midwestern communities had that people like Lawrence Welk got their start in and traveling bands in a bus would come and play on the weekend and it was usually, oftentimes they were along rivers and uh, many, many, many communities in Nebraska, the Dakotas, Iowa, Kansas had the, these halls. And this is the story of Dora Jean Meltzer who was the ticket taker in the Roseland Gardens in Riverview Park. And I'll start with a little description of Dora Jean and you'll get the idea of what key, how Keyes writes. Dora Jean Meltzer was sitting on a high stool in the Roseland Gardens ticket booth. She had her neck turned back as far as she could and through the Isinglass window in the back door she could get a good view of the whole dance floor with the couple swinging around to the last chorus of All My Life. From behind the faded pink crepe paper fringe that bordered the orchestra's platform the bass player smiled broadly and swung his arm out and back and out and back. The bass player was a cute boy, Dora Jean mused. He was cute, all right. He had a cute smile. He swung one of, she swung one of her shapely legs back and forth in time with the rhythm. Dora Jean thought, gee, it was no fun being cooped up in an old ticket booth when everybody else was having fun. And Dora Jean imagines. She was Anne Harding now, glorious blonde Anne, and she didn't have crooked teeth or a nose that was too pointed. She was Anne Harding, and Ronald Coleman was just about to ask her to go away with him in his Packard convertible. I belong to you alone, Ronald, Dora Jean Meltzer whispered to herself. We are one forever and a day. Doesn't sound like a dreamy-eyed high school girl in a small town. Behind her, Ted Pope and his serenaders broke into Who's Sorry Now with the trombone carrying the melody. Dora Jean stopped being Ad Harding and began to think about the bass player in Ted Pope's band. He was cute. She craned her neck around again to look at the orchestra. They looked keen in their gray double-breasted suits and their burgundy colored shirts and yellow neckties. It was a swell band. The best the park had booked since Maury Edwards and his swinging serenaders had been there. Looking at the three women, Dora Jean began to think that they were only a few years older than she was, five or six or seven years perhaps, and already they were thin and unattractive and cross-looking. They had just let themselves go. But that wasn't true. Her mother was still a young woman, really, and for years she had looked like they did. They all got to look that way. Dora Jean thought there was something about being poor and having to struggle for a living that took their youth and their good looks away from them in no time, in just no time at all. It would happen to her too, she thought sadly. And when you're writing a story about the depression in a small town, to talk about that struggle for a living that takes away youth and good looks in no time at all, I think rings true. Those three women were still there. Dora Jean wished they would go, go away and stay away. She imagined herself as one of them, married, Mrs. Arthur Dobb. Her husband working nights, coming out to the Roseland with some other women, standing out there on that old mound. She couldn't stand thinking about it. It wasn't going to be that way. It wasn't. Only it would be that way if she married Art. And if she didn't, what else could she do but just go on selling tickets, night after night after night. I think he captures, for those people who do feel trapped, and particularly young people, and even today, uh, I taught high school for 15 years, and even today, it's the young people, many of them, who feel trapped in their towns, and I think he can speak to them, even though it's a Depression-era story, can speak to them today.
I want to give you an idea of what Keyes wrote about the upper class, those people who stayed in the Midwestern communities and those people that he saw as hypocritical, as small-minded, as laughable, as uh, not the kind of people he admired. The Purcells were uh, based completely on a very real family in Beatrice. The house where the story takes place is, still stands and is clearly identifiable. The family is readily identifiable to people who know anything about the history of Beatrice. In fact, it's a slanderous story in many ways. In the story, the, the, uh, Mr. Purcell, the, the man of the family, uh, ultimately runs off with another woman and uh, has uh, for years had an affair with the other woman and finally leaves the fine home to the other woman when he dies. Well, in the records of the Gage County Courthouse, that's exactly what happened. And in fact, the other woman still lives in Beatrice. So we have to be a little bit careful with names and that sort of thing with this story. Let me give you a description of the house. And you'll see this house is not limiting. This is a, a fine home uh, in the community but it still has a touch of something not quite right. The house was large and white with a vast veranda and surrounded by rose bushes. It had an ordered, almost severe air and seemed only remotely related to the rooms that it enclosed. Viewed from a distance among the neighboring houses, red brick or gray stone, garnished with rusting ironwork, it gave the impression of one of those homes which paint companies are so often fond of having photographed for reproduction in magazine advertisements. And the people in the house, the Purcells, Weldon describes this way, and he describes their getting older. By the way, as a boy, Weldon's mother would make him go to this home and to these people for afternoon tea. And uh, he was required to accompany his mother on a walk about two blocks down the street to visit the, uh, the family and, and have tea. And, and you can imagine a 12-year-old boy whose mother forced him along, uh, why he might come up with some of the attitudes he did. But what happened to the people, and it, 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 it's, it's a touch of humor for as sad a story as it is, it, it is funny. As they grew older, they both found difficulty in remaining awake. The Purcells sat in front of us in church. Not long after the sermon had begun, their heads would nod, and they would soon fall into prolonged but fortunately quiet slumber. On the occasion, Mr. Purcell, who was in the habit of putting his fingers into the holes used for holding communion glasses, neglected to take them out before falling asleep. When he was awakened by a blast from the organ and the shrill voices of the choir, he discovered that his fingers had become so swollen that he could not remove them. I believe it was necessary, finally, to send for a carpenter before Mr. Purcell was able to leave the church. They also slept in theaters. Several times my aunt and I went with them, and they always dozed, but never would either of them admit that they had been anything else than wide awake. Coming out of the theater, both would comment on how enjoyable the picture had been. They were quick to change the subject, however, if a detailed discussion of the film arose. Yet in spite of their few eccentricities, they led lives of the utmost respectability, large contributors to the church, to civic and patriotic and charitable organizations, voting the straight Republican ticket, and I think well satisfied on the whole with their existences. And the man, Mr. Purcell, in this story was, in fact, a, a Secretary of Agriculture for the Governor of Nebraska. Uh, Mrs. Purcell, the character she's based on, was, in fact, the head of the local DAR chapter. Uh, they were wealthy. Both of them have towns named after them in southeast Nebraska. And uh, they were people of the utmost respectability. But Weldon, of course, likes to expose that. He gets Mrs. Purcell when she falls asleep when he tells this story, one of my favorites. Mrs. Purcell seemed to find it less difficult to remain awake at her husband's movies. These are home movies he would show of the farms, their farm operations. And Mrs. Purcell seemed to find it less difficult to remain awake at her husband's movies than at others. Perhaps it was said because of the interest she took in her own film personality. But she was not always able to keep her eyes open. And it was at about this time that her period of silent sleep gave way to a sleep characterized by restlessness and snoring. There was one appalling evening when, just as a view of some of Mr. Purcell's prize hogs, wallowing and grunting in a muddy pen, was thrown on the screen for us to admire, Mrs. Purcell, who had fallen asleep a few moments before, began to snore in a ghastly animal fashion. Someone snickered. It was a horrible moment 
and for a while one scarcely dared to breathe. When at length the lights were turned on, Mrs. Purcell awakened and smiled brightly at her guests as though she had been awake all the time. The ultimate end of the story is, uh, is quite sad. Mrs. Purcell develops an illness and becomes, as he describes it, grotesquely huge. And uh, on her deathbed, as she becomes bedridden, she finds out about her husband's affair. And despite the efforts of her attendants to keep her in bed, she manages to rouse herself out of bed and put a, a covering over her. And she heads out of the house and uh, the the, uh, as, as, as Weldon describes it, she was huge. She put on an old white lace dress of hers that split up the sides as she got into it. When the nurse tried to keep her from leaving, Mrs. Purcell struck her with her arm and rushed from the house. She must have been headed for the drugstore. That's where the rendezvous between her husband and his mistress occurred. She was within a block of it when she fell dead in the street in front of a pool hall. And that irony is, uh, is incredible. And of course, she had a magnificent funeral and her grieving husband, uh, Weldon describes, and, and uh, uh, later then the, the husband does leave the, the community, leaving the house to his mistress. And a very sad story, but typical of what Weldon thought of the powers that be in these small towns. The range of, of his effort in these stories is tremendous. He, uh, he I, I read you examples of the Midwestern-based stories. He does have a, one story, The Evening of the Fourth of July, that's a very surrealistic story. Uh, nothing in it can be true. It's hard to make sense of it. It's full of amazing and incredible uh, things happening. He writes stories about uh, working for public libraries. He writes stories about a trip to Hollywood. So he has a, a broader range than I've given you here, but those were some of the more interesting stories that uh, fill his uh, collection of, of short stories. Keyes' short stories were published in magazines during his life. He was able to publish his work in, in regional and some national uh, magazines. And Edward O'Brien, who for years edited the, the best short stories of, and then there would be a year, best short stories of 1930, of 1931, and so on, his final volume, and I believe it was 1939, uh, at about that time anyway, right, be, uh, the last volume Edward O'Brien did before he died, he dedicated to Weldon Keyes. He dedicated that volume to Keyes. So he was recognized as, as a, uh, an up-and-coming short story writer. But very suddenly, Keyes stopped writing short stories. By this time, he'd moved to Denver. After graduating from the university, he moved to Denver, married his sweetheart from the University of Nebraska. Her name was Ann Swan. And they lived in Denver. He worked for a library. He finished his work. He completed his uh, Master of Library Science degree and had an extremely responsible position as a bibliographic librarian, uh, head of a regional library system, sort of the forerunner of the, the kinds of uh, things that are, are, are commonplace and, and done uh, now uh, all the time. People who know Weldon and Ann in Denver say that they lived lives of complete ordinariness, that they looked like what we would today call yuppies. They were up and coming young couple. They worked hard. They were well liked. They did not appear strange. They didn't appear what we would call bohemian uh, in any way. And they were, uh, he earned a good living. Uh, also found time to do his writing. It was during this time he first began writing novels and make it, made attempts with the help of Mari Sandoz, who put him in touch with her publisher, to publish his novels. One of his novels ultimately was accepted by a publisher conditionally, and then when World War II broke out, it was the, the, the publication of the novel was, was canceled because the publisher thought that the taste of the country had changed and the country was no longer interested in the kind of thing Keyes had written. And that novel finally was published and uh, uh, is now available in print uh, for people who... And it, it's, it's a story about a, a college English professor in a, in a college in a Midwestern town. And many people think it's based on Lincoln, but not everybody would say that. But it's, it's an interesting, fun story about uh, college life. But it was at about this time that, that with some suddenness, Weldon Keyes abandoned fiction and turned to poetry and abandoned the Midwest and turned to New York. 
and he left, he left his wife in Denver. They separated briefly. She would rejoin him later, but he did even call it a separation in his letters and asked friends not to speak of it to his family. Uh, he left uh, the sure job in the Midwest, went to New York City, and in New York City, he had a, a reasonably successful life. He was not uh, 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 able to, to support himself in a, uh, uh, a lifestyle that was, was wild or that was uh, uh, what we would call sophisticated or aristocratic, but he had enough work to, to keep busy and respectable work beyond just publishing occasional poems in magazines. He worked for uh, The Nation magazine. He was art critic for The Nation. He wrote a regular monthly column for The Nation magazine. And he also wrote periodic reviews for magazines like The New Republic. He uh, w was under contract for some time with Time magazine. His uh, work appeared in the New York Times book review and a number of other uh, magazines of that stature. He also worked for Paramount Newsreels and had a successful career as uh, a writer and editor for newsreels. And in fact, probably the most famous newsreel of the time, which was the newsreel of the, ato the, the test atomic bomb explosion at Bikini Island, uh, Weldon Keyes had considerable responsibility for and did a lot of work on that. During this time, he also took up painting. And he was an abstract expressionist painter. The painting over here, on the wall, which the Heritage Room owns, is uh, by Weldon Keys, and it's a good example of the kind of work that he did. In New York, he had one-man shows. He had group shows with the leading artists of the time, people like Jackson Pollock and Hans Hoffman and Willem de Kooning, um, Rothko, um, and the, that whole group of, of well-known abstract expressionist painters. Keyes started a, 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 what he called Forum 48 first in 1948 and later Forum 49 in Provincetown uh, in Massachusetts on Cape Cod, which was a community of, of primarily artists, but other uh, painting artists, but other kinds of artists, literary artists and that sort of thing as well. And he developed a, seri a lecture series, lecture and discussion series that was uh, interdisciplinary and, and designed to explore this art and its connections with other kinds of art. And some of the people of the time have written of the experience and, and uh, say that give Keyes all of the credit for organizing and seeing this, uh, this movement through. And one of them describes that after one of the lectures, the whole group went to Hans Hoffman's home and Weldon Keyes played jazz music on the piano and there was uninhibited dancing. So apparently they had fun and a good time. It was during this time that he wrote uh, many of his best poems, and I think this would be a good time to share those with you. His poetry is what he seems to be best remembered for, where if he made a mark that will last, his mark seems to be people like Dana Joya, uh, a current critic, a very active critic, well critic, well-respected critic, um, Kenneth Rexroth, who was a, a, a sort of poetry guru of the, the 1940s, Donald Justice, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in the early 1970s. People like this call Weldon Keyes one of the two or three best poets of the mid-century generation in this country, of that period in the 1940s and 1950s, and it was quite a group and they consider him at the top of their list. Uh, another one of his fans would be Howard Nemiroff, who was the first poet laureate of the United States uh, by act of Congress. And these people like Weldon Keyes' poetry. And I'd like to share some of it with you. It's fascinating poetry. It's dark poetry. It's sad. It's not hopeful. It's not optimistic. Um, you'll find that it's quite formal poetry. He does use meter, he uses rhyme, he uses established forms with some regularity. He's not completely bound by them, but you'll, you'll hear the rhyme and you'll hear the meter and the form in the poems as well. During his life, he published three separate volumes of poetry, and they've been collected into uh, a single volume, which is uh, published by the University of Nebraska Press. They just reissued a new edition so it's readily available, and all of his collected poems are, are in this work. I want to start by reading what he used as the epigram to his final volume. And it's a quote from Nathaniel Hawthorne that sums up the spirit that I think you'll hear resonating throughout these poems. 
It's a quote from Hawthorne's uh, short story, The Marble Fawn, where he writes of, I quote, those dark caverns into which all men must descend if they would know anything beneath the surface and elusive pleasures of existence. And that's what Keyes does. He tries to enter those dark caverns. He tries to get beneath the surface of our existence. And certainly he wants to get away from the elusive pleasures of our life. I'll start with what's my favorite poem. It's entitled simply 1926. And it's a short poem written by a man in the 1940s about his own childhood, about being 12 years old. So you will hear the echoes of Weldon Keyes' own past in this poem. But it's also much more than that. Uh, the details of the poem, by the way, once again ring completely true with his neighborhood in Beatrice, Nebraska. And the people and the places that he mentions are all very true. It goes like this. The porch light coming on again, early November, the dead leaves raked in piles, the wicker swing creaking. Across the lots, a phonograph is playing Jada, an orange moon. I see the lives of neighbors mapped and marred like all the wars ahead, and R, insane, B, with his throat cut, 15 years from now, in Omaha. I did not know them then. My Airedale scratches at the door, and I am back from seeing Milton Sills and Doris Kenyon, 12 years old, the porch light coming on again. Now, in one sense, that's a poem filled with very ordinary images. Keyes did have an Airedale dog that scratched at the door. Uh, the leaves raked in piles in November, which you could find in any neighborhood in any town in the United States. Uh, Milton Sills and Doris Kenyon were silent film stars, and there was a movie theater two blocks down the street from Weldon's home he and his friends often went to. He would be walking home from that. There are those kinds of very ordinary images, but he also incorporates then those very horrible images of all the wars ahead, and in 1926, that's a very real uh, thought and of his own friends or of people in the neighborhood who were to meet with disasters later on. Now someone else living in that same neighborhood, neighborhood could have just as easily looked down the street and seen a different house and written about the happy, successful, prosperous life that someone was to have from that home. But Keyes chose to write about these instead. The key line, I think, in the poem for me is the line, I did not know them then. And it's very true, I think, that, that for a man in his 40s or late 30s to look back on when he was 12 years old and realize you didn't know the people that were around you. But I think the poem does much more than that. In 1926, I think it could also be said with a considerable accuracy that the United States did not know itself then. And he writes about personal disasters that were to come, but I don't think you can ignore the national disasters that were to follow. And when in the late 1940s, you look back at World War II and at the Depression, the poem becomes much more than just a study of Weldon Keyes and his psychology, but uh, it has much deeper meaning. Keyes is very good with what I call a closing line that twists his meaning home, that startles us, that makes us gasp, that horrifies us, really. As I read this, imagine what it would be like to be a man looking at his sleeping daughter and the kind of images that most men, most fathers see when they look at their daughters and then hear what Weldon Keyes writes. For my daughter, looking into my daughter's eyes, I read beneath the innocence of morning flesh concealed, hintings of death she does not heed. Coldest of winds have blown this hair, and mesh of seaweed snarled these miniatures of hands. The night's slow poison, tolerant and bland, has moved her blood. Parched years that I have seen, that may be hers, appear. Foul, lingering death in certain war, the slim legs green. Or, fed on hate, she relishes the sting of others' agony, perhaps the cruel bride of a syphilitic or a fool. These speculations sour in the sun. 
I have no daughter. I desire none. And our initial reaction, I think, is we're glad he doesn't have a daughter. <laughs> if these are the thoughts he would think. Uh, a man who would look at his daughter and see her marrying a syphilitic, see her marrying a fool, seeing her be the kind of person who relishes the agony of others. Um, what a sad, sad image. At the same time, what a, what, what wonderful use of words and poetry. A line like, these speculations sour in the sun. Uh, there's a great deal of poetry in a line like that. The other poem I want to read for you that has a, a particularly startling ending is simply entitled 4HV, HV being initials, and then in parentheses the dates 1901 to 1927. So you know from the beginning it's about a death, and it's about a death of someone who died at the age of 26, which is much different than some poems about death could be. And by the way, in 1927, the year of the death, Weldon Keyes would have been 13 years old, and I think that's an age when many people begin to come to grips with what death is, and many even attend their first funeral at that age. And Weldon Keyes' grandfather, that powerful figure in the family, died that year. And this poem is not about him, but the, the subject could have easily been prompted by that kind of experience. For HV, I remember the clumsy surgery, the face scarred out of recognition, ruined and not his own. Wax hands fattened among pink silk and pinker roses. The minister was in fine form that afternoon. I remember the ferns, the organ faintly out of tune, the gray light, the two extended prayers, rain falling on stained glass, the pallbearers selected by the family, and none of them his friends. And there's that twist again at the end of, of shock, of unhappiness, uh, of the horror of the kinds of lives that we're confronted with. The poems that are most anthologized of Keyes' are a group of poems he wrote, three of them actually, about a character uh, uh, named Robinson. And I think this is uh, somewhat of a mythical character, although he certainly has elements of Weldon Keyes of autobiography. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about the name Robinson. Uh, most people think that perhaps it's sort of a play on Robinson Crusoe. Uh, this is sort of an everyman type of character. The setting moves to New York City for the Robinson poems. And I'll read one of them to you. It's called Aspects of Robinson. And you'll hear the references to New York City in this, I think. And of a man lost as much in a city as his other people are lost in their small towns. Robinson at cards in the Algonquin. A thin blue light comes down once more outside the blinds. Gray men in overcoats are ghosts blown past the door. The taxis streak the avenues with yellow, orange, and red. This is Grand Central, Mr. Robinson. Robinson on a roof above the heights. The boats mourn like the lost. Water is slate, far down. Through sounds of ice cubes dropped in glass, an osteopath, dressed for the lynx, describes an old in-tourist tour. Here's where old Gibbons jumped from, Robinson. Robinson walking in the park, admiring the elephant. Robinson buying the Tribune, Robinson buying the Times, Robinson saying hello. Yes, this is Robinson. Sunday at five, I'd love to. Pretty well, and you? Robinson alone at Longchamps, staring at the wall. Robinson afraid, drunk, sobbing Robinson. In bed with a Mrs. Morse. Robinson at home. Decisions, Toynbee or Luminol. Where the sun shines, Robinson in flowered trunks, eyes toward the breakers. Where the night ends, Robinson in east side bars. Robinson in Glen plaid jacket, scotch grain shoes, black four in hand and Oxford button down, the jeweled and silent watch that winds itself, the briefcase, covert top coat, clothes for the spring, all covering his sad and usual heart, dry as a winter leaf. And there again, that comparison of a man's heart dry as a winter leaf. I think makes us very uncomfortable to hear that.
is simply titled Back. And it sort of tells the, the story of a life. Much cry and little wool. I have come back as empty handed as I went. Although the woods were full and past the track, the heavy boughs were bent down to my knees with fruit ripe for a still life. I had meant my trip as a search for stones. But the beach was bare, except for the drying bones of a fish, shells, an old wool shirt, a rubber boot, a strip of lemon rind. They were not what I had in mind. It was merely stones. Well, the days are full. This day, at least, is spent. Much cry and little wool. I have come back as empty-handed as I went. This was the last poem to the final volume that Keyes published during his lifetime, and it's entitled Small Prayer. Change, move, dead clock, that this fresh day may break with dazzling light to these sick eyes. Burn, glare, old sun, so long unseen, that time may find its sound again and cleanse whatever it is that a wound remembers after the healing ends. I think that's a marvelous image. Whatever it is that a wound remembers after the healing ends. And with Weldon Keyes, we can't help but speculate about the wounds that he knew in his life and what remained from them after the healing. His poems are marvelous and they deserve to be remembered. Just as he had done in Denver though, Keyes became unhappy in New York and moved to San Francisco and led uh, in many ways a much, uh, again, a much different life in San Francisco. He became involved in a wide variety of enterprises. With filmmaking, he produced some of his own films, including doing the photography. He wrote musical scores for other films. He did, uh, still photography and moving photography for uh, clinical psychologic studies, a uh, book that's still in print entitled Nonverbal Communication, which he did with Jürgen Reusch, and is considered the first study in nonverbal communication and is still a classic of, of, of the form. He lectured for classes that S.I. Hayakawa taught at uh, San Francisco State University and was involved in, in many, many activities. He continued his writing of poetry. He continued his painting. He also wrote a one-act play. He wrote more music uh, and did quite a bit with music. He staged what today we would call happenings. And this was uh, in the 1950s, long before the, the 60s when those became popular. Uh, but he called them highbrow vaudeville shows. I think that's a neat term, highbrow vaudeville. <laughs> But they would be uh, shows of, of, of great variety. There would be music, there would be plays, there would be poetry readings, there would be piano playing. And at one of them, one of the performers was a young San Francisco housewife who was just beginning to uh, get her start in the entertainment business, and Weldon Keyes wrote some of her earliest routines, and we know her today as Phyllis Diller. And I think that's kind of, kind of fun. Keyes, though, began to experience the kind of depressive episodes that had bothered him all his life, really, with greater frequency in San Francisco. And in many ways, despite his success, he saw his life as falling apart. His marriage with Anne broke up. She had considerable trouble with alcoholism, and there's evidence that Weldon was having trouble with that also. Also a lot of evidence that he was taking medication that was prescribed for her and probably had uh, uh, the wrong kinds of effects on him. Many people say he was uh, clearly a clinical manic depressant. Um, his relationship with his parents deteriorated. He felt very guilty. They had to finance the publication of his last volume of poems. And his mother didn't let him forget that they did that. And uh, that apparently bothered him to some extent. And finally, in 1955, Weldon's car was found at the entrance to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. While no body was ever discovered, most people believe that uh, he walked out onto the bridge and committed suicide. There was some talk that he might have gone to Mexico to start a new life. He had told friends he would do that, 
and many people held out the hope that he did that. And in fact, uh, stories would come back. People would say they had a beer with Weldon Keyes in a bar in Mexico City. Uh, Pete Hamill, a very respected journalist, essayist, short story writer, uh, claimed, claimed that, for example. Certainly, he could still be alive, having been born in 1914. But other people who knew Weldon Keyes say that that can't have happened because he never would have kept silent for so long, and we would have heard from him. He also confessed three days before his disappearance that he had indeed walked out on the Golden Gate Bridge intending to jump, but he looked down and lost his nerve. The day that he disappeared, a heavy fog had rolled in, and you could look down and not see the bottom. And so in that sense, perhaps he simply stepped into oblivion. Weldon Keyes' reputation has lasted. He was only 41 when he disappeared. Fewer than a thousand total volumes of his three books of poetry had been published. But his reputation, if anything, is growing. Uh, currently in print are a collection of his reviews and essays that he wrote for magazines during the New York years primarily, uh, a new edition of his collected poems, and Faber and Faber in London is now issuing the poetry abroad. Um, the book Robert Knoll did of Weldon Keyes' letters, the long unpublished novel is currently available. Uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation was just in Nebraska and other sites to film a documentary on Keyes uh, and his influence on a poet from England. The University of Iowa is exploring a major Keyes project and there's uh, an increasing interest in, in Weldon Keyes. So we can hope that, that his writing and his life will, will continue to, to have an influence as they seem to have had an influence on many of the poets and writers of our time. I'll end with just a, a short paragraph from one of Keyes' essays. This is an essay about popular music. It's entitled Muskrat Ramble. Uh, first appeared in a, in a book, uh, The Scene Before You, in 1955. And I think it says a lot about Weldon Keyes, and it also tells us how closely in tune he was with the realities of our time. Monolithic symbol of the whole period is the jukebox. This permanent guest in public places that squats like some ominous and temporarily static beast, a foam with lights and tubes of colored water. It might have been built by Andre Breton in collaboration with some monstrously sick and divided opponent of industrialism who had spent a claustrophobic lifetime in Greek candy stores. There it sits, booming or silently awaiting a nickel, ready with a rainy night in Rio and Perry Como, where the piano player used to be, his cigarette turning the ivories of the upper register a sickly Mars yellow. He was not often a good pianist, but he knew more tunes than the 20 the jukebox knows, and you could talk to him. And to me, that really sums up our time and that we have lost touch with talking with each other and that, that maybe that's the source of some of those wounds that, that Weldon Keys fit. Before closing, I should mention for people's benefit that the Heritage Room here is the, the major national depository of Keyes-related material. Uh, and the family uh, gave a, a great deal of material to this library, his correspondence, and he knew everybody. Correspondence with people like Conrad Aiken and William Carlos Williams, uh, and the, many of the, the, the big names of the time, uh, along with manuscripts of his work with uh, childhood and adult scrapbook type materials. And it's really an amazing collection and a valuable resource that's here in the Heritage Room that people should uh, be aware exists. He's a fascinating man and I would uh, encourage you to, to read more about him. <laughs>